Can you wait long, eh? Don't you? Three weeks and we don't see him. He's right back with us, refreshed and vital and vibrant. Please help me welcome our beloved Reverend John to the mic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, family. <laughs> We're glad to see you now. And glad to know that you are online as well, worldwide family. Welcome to another beautiful, I nearly said quiet moment in the garden, but it's, it's, it's not so quiet this morning. We are making a joyful noise, and it is wonderful to be back. I, I am back uh, from vacation, feeling rested and rejuvenated, and ready to tackle the million and one things I have to do as I prepare to wind up. We don't wind it down at the temple, we wind up to my retirement date of November 30th, 2022. Just before I went off on vacation, one of the participants in our Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life program, unwittingly, um, at the, that's the prison, the, the program in the prison here in Kingston, unwittingly gave me the idea for this morning's encouragement. As I've told you before, at, the, at that course, which is 12 weeks, one of the classes is devoted to having a conversation about what is their most desired thing. And I think I've shared with you, and you, you could imagine, most of them most desire what? Freedom. Freedom. But this young man at the last class, which ended just the last Tuesday, the, the first Tuesday of August, when I said, what is your most desired thing? He said, more time. No, those of my cohort, people in my age group, know that in, in old Jamaica, that was a way of saying, see you later, or so long. You'd say, more time, as you, as you left somebody's presence, right? So for a moment, I thought he was saying, more time, I'm gone. So I said, what, you're not staying for the rest of the class? You're gone? You turn your back? So he said, no, uncle. You asked, what is my most desired thing? And I said, I want more time. So I said, you want more time in this place? So the class laughed, of course. And he said, no. And there was this long pause. He said, I want more time to make up for all the evil that I've done in my 25 years. It's not, it's almost every Tuesday, my boys, you know, friends. Almost every Tuesday, water come on my eye. And I want you to know that I don't go into that institution. In fact, I never stand at the podium, I never give a talk without first saying to the father, Father, blot out John Scott so that you can speak. And so sometimes some things come out of my mouth and people tell me I've told them things which I have no recollection of having said. But I remember what I said to him. I said, listen to me, Godson. I want you to listen to me very carefully. Remember what the master Yeshua Bar Joseph, a.k.a. Jesus, said as they strung him up to murder him. There was a convicted thief strung up beside him. And that man said to him, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Reverend Anne read from the inspiration reading this morning, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And so when that thief said to the master, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Do you remember what the, re the response was? Anybody online remember? This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Today. Not tomorrow. Not in some future time that we have to work towards and be good or, the, the, or God put an X against our name. Today, and so there is no need for more time because all of God, I'm speaking to him you know, in, the, in, the, in the, the chapel at the prison, all of God is present right where you are in this moment. Everybody say with me, and you say it with me now too, all of God is present in this moment. Together? All of God is present in this moment. So I've titled my encouragement today, Savor each moment and you'll have more time. Savor each moment and you will have more time. 
Because today, all of God is where you are. Today, and in fact, this moment, this very instant, this second, is really the only time you have, my friends, my family. More time. More time, more time. So many people tell me they are desperate for more time. And you know, one of the paradoxes of our modern era is that we have made all kinds of devices and um, equipment and uh, instruments to make our lives easier. You know, they have robots now cleaning the house and all kinds of inventions to make life easier. And people still say, I need more time. Time is running out on me. But you know, friends, after meditating on the business of more time for a while, I began to see that it's not time itself that's the problem. It is not a case of time management. It is a case of self-management. How do we manage ourselves in the time that we have? And time, as you know, is a construct of the human mind. Time is a creation of our ego. An enlightened perspective must put time then in its place. Let us go back to that wonderful story in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was regarded and has been regarded over the centuries by Orthodox Christianity as the first sin. And it was, it's, what it's referred to as the fall. But it wasn't a fall, my friends. It was the beginning of the evolution of human consciousness. It was a quantum leap in consciousness into the awareness of who and what we are and that we have the gift that God has given to all humanity, the gift of choice. That we can choose whom we serve, what we think, what we do, and how we want to be in this moment. Wow. When I stand before those, those, those people incarcerated and I say, this moment you can choose because you're not your past, you're not what you have done. Today, you can be with the spirit within you in paradise, in the kingdom, K-I-N-D-O-M, that makes us all brothers and sisters in a world that hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Righteousness being the right useness of the law of mind. And so I want to, you just to think about this business of being in the moment. Because ego consciousness has dis tries to let us believe that we're running out of time. Now, nothing is wrong with the ego, my friends. Let me just tell you. We need it. It is an essential part of our, our makeup as human beings. But we need to have it under control. Just imagine, you know, your seven-year-old son or daughter trying to convince you to let them drive the car. You know, you don't throw them out the car or say, don't be, you know, stupid picnic. You humor them and say, yeah, you soon get to, you soon get to that, that stage, son, or that stage, darling, whatever you call your, your little ones. And it's the same thing with our ego. It is essential, but you don't want to throw it out or kill it. You just don't want it to drive your life. So you put it in perspective and you, you say, look, spirit within me, a dat make me jump and sing, according to Steve Golding's beautiful God, ribby dibby dibby, God working. It is God working in my life and the spirit within me that directs my every footstep along the pathway that I have chosen. So we put ego consciousness in its place. And I'm not dissing time, you know, because those of you that know me know I'm rather strict and particular about being on time. And I often say to my friends who are habitually late, 
for appointment. Sometimes just five minutes or ten minutes. You know, you know, I've noticed that some people come to church ten past nine every Sunday of life. And there's always a reason why they couldn't get here at nine. They mean to come in now. And as they're driving out and something happened. They forget them while they have to turn back. Whatever it is. I'd say to them, if you are in the habit of being slightly late for everything, you have set up a pattern in the universe that makes your good come to you slightly late. If you are always chronically late, you have set up a pattern in the universe that is attracting chronic lateness for your good to arrive to you as well. It comes, you know, but you have to wait. So we need to establish habits of punctuality and being on time. So I'm not dissing time. Many of the great masters have taught that the present moment is perfect just as it is and have urged us to be mindful of that moment. There's a Taoist parable that beautifully illustrates the living in the moment and the going in the flow. According to this parable, uh, there was a monk walking down the riverbanks and he noticed uh, an old man walking on the very edge of the gorge. And the river was roaring. It was spewing out of the mountain with a ferocity that was just breathtaking. And there were jagged rocks and huge boulders in the river. And as the monk was saying, wow, look at the power of God, the old man slipped and fell into the raging surf. And the, the monk was so, so uh, uh, astonished, amazed, and sorrowful, he began to chant the chant for the dead. When all of a sudden... The old man popped, just popped out back of the river downstream on his side, on the monk's side, perfectly unharmed and landed on his two feet. So the monk hurried up to catch him up and said, no, no, I have to talk to you. What just happened? How did you manage that incredible feat? And the old man said, it's really quite simple. I went in with a swirl and I came out with a twirl. <laughs> the parable is a deep teaching on the power of saying yes every moment and that old man must have been trained in the the art of complete relaxation it's a parable but we all know of actual stories of drunkards and babies uh, who go through accidents without a scratch and without being harmed because they have not resisted the power that was threatening to to <laughs> swamp them and over, overtake them if you go with the flow the resistance, of course, is not there. It's the resistance that harms you. So one of my favorite films of yesteryear, and many of you may remember it, it won many Academy Awards a few years ago, portrayed this same enlightened uh, perspective on life. It was the film um, Forrest Gump. Remember Forrest Gump? It captured so many Oscars. And it, the secret of its success, I believe, was the, the paradoxical wisdom that it gave. If you don't resist the flow of life, not only will you survive, but you will thrive. Just like the little old man in the Taoist parable, Forrest is totally open and gives way to the flow. He goes with the flow in all situations. He learned from his mama. Remember she said, you never know what you're going to get. And so she taught him the lesson with a box of chocolates. <laughs> and Forrest knew that you never knew exactly what flavor you were going to get. Was it, was it filled with orange or was it a cherry in the center or was it nuts? But he knew whatever you got would be good. And the big aha for Forrest was if you didn't like it when you took the first bite of the one you chose, what you do? Choose again. And that is the lesson, that you, you have choice and you can choose and choose and choose. There is no limit to the amount of choices you can make. So this brings me to your assignment. I'll come back from leaving if you wasn't going to get an assignment. But this is a very pleasurable, sweet assignment. I gave it a few years ago, maybe eight or ten years ago. And people who did it said that it, it really worked for them. I want you to get yourself a small box of chocolates or a, 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 a bag of chocolate kisses, or even a bar of chocolate. And every day this week, I want you just to pause. Eat one square of the bar, 
or one chocolate or one chocolate kiss. And as it melts in your mouth and you savor the taste, say these six words over and over until the chocolate is completely dissolved in your mouth. Say just this right now. Just this. Say it with me right now. Just this right now. Just this. Just this moment. Just in this breath, I am savoring this moment in life. Just this right now. Just this. If you can't eat chocolate, then choose grapes or a fruit or some other delicious morsel and do the same thing. Just this right now. Just this. New Thought author Dennis Merritt Jones, in the book that Reverend Sonia and Reverend Anna are, is exploring, says, and I quote, mindfulness brings your beingness into, brings our beingness into our doingness. Mindfulness brings our beingness into our doingness. So that instead of just being humans doing, we are what we were intended to be, humans being. As Mary Jones puts it, quote, the irony is our body cannot be any place other than in the present moment. But for far too often, our mind is elsewhere. Mindfulness is the practice of calling the thinking mind back to where the body is, wherein the two become as one in the present moment. Mind and body in the same place in the present moment. Mary Jones writes, as you incorporate your awareness of being present in the moment, your doing, the one the who, that's the who of who you are, becomes infused with your being, the what you are, as the activity at hand. At this level of mindful living, your every action becomes a portal for a potential redefining moment, be it while driving the car, mowing the lawn, changing the baby's diaper, selling real estate, performing brain surgery, or making love to your significant other. I like the last one best. <laughs> Be in the moment. The primary thing is to be present with what you are doing, and you will be amazed at what will be revealed to you in the moment. So this week, practice mindfully savoring your chocolate and saying what? Just this, right now, just this. I've been mindful also that while you, I beg you, don't put your, your dinner on a plate and sit before the TV and shovel the food into your mouth mindlessly while you watch um, the news or whatever. Make a point of sitting and savoring your meal um, and the person that you're sharing it with. And if you live alone like me, then savor your own company. Look at the patterns of the food on the plate, the color, the aroma. Be present. Be present, my friends, in the moment. Because this day, you can be in the paradise of the kingdom of God within you. Other thing I want you to remember is, if you feel pressed for time this week, is that the universe is on your side. There's an amusing story told about the late, great Albert Einstein, who was asked when he was near his moment of transition by a, an interviewer, he said, Mr. Einstein, of all the questions you have ever asked, what was the most important? <laughs> this is a man about to make his transition, you know. And you can, you can just see the, the, the report or the, the interviewer getting his pen ready to write something heavy and, you know, meaningful and, you know, and weighty about, about consciousness and quasars and, you know, black holes. And Einstein said, oh, that's easy. The question is, is the universe a friendly place or not? And you know, friends, every great mind, every seer, every prophet, every great teacher, every guru has taught that the universe is for you. And as we say in Jamaica, what is for you? Can be on for you. The universe is for you. It has your back. It wants you to succeed. This day, you shall be with the spirit of life, of love, of laughter, of joy, in the paradise of being a divine 
creation of the Almighty living in the kingdom of God. So one such rare soul who taught this was, of course, Dr. Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this teaching known as the science of mind and spirit. In his, the foreword of his very first book, Creative Mind, which was published in 1917, Ernest Holmes writes, and I quote, the hand of eternal progress is brushing the cobwebs from the corridors of time. Don't you love that imagery? Brushing the cobwebs from the corridors of time and is again revealing to the human race the mysteries of being. As there is nothing new under the sun, the searchlight of truth is bringing to light only what has been known to the few in all generations. The time has now come when the few must become the many. The whole world, from the least to the greatest, must know the truth so that man may understand the great laws that govern his life. He must learn to control his own destiny, to heal his own body, and bring happiness to his own soul. Ignorance must vanish, and understanding must be ushered in. Man is no longer to be governed by anything outside himself. Creeds, doctrines, churches, institutions, organizations, governments are all being changed to give place to the realization of the individual. There is a power in and through all that is working this great transformation. All that will not measure up to the standard must fall by its own weight. All that is in line with the truth must still prosper. The time is at hand Holmes says, we are in the greatest age of all history. We are in the age of the unifying of all people and all things into the ever-present one. The temple not made with hands is now being silently built by the, emancipation, the, by the emancipated souls of this planet. End of that brilliant quote from Ernest Holmes. So my friends, the time is at hand. And we are the emancipated souls to whom Ernest Holmes refers. Let us be mindful of our responsibility to create a world that works for everyone. Let us trust the universe and trust our own authority and ability to manage the task of building the temple of our enlightened consciousness of oneness. That is what we are about at this temple of light. Turn to your neighbor and say, deeply we are one. Namaste. Deeply we are one. Namaste. My friends, yes. Deeply we are one. Namaste. More time. Thank you. Justice right now. Justice. Well, Reverend John, thank you for that encouragement. <laughs> oh, I can just see myself. I mean, I ate chocolates for the longest. I mean, I cut my eye after it when I went in the supermarket, but I'm buying it today. One square, one square. One square, just this right now. And just savor that in this moment is our paradise. Thank God for this teaching, this choice that we have to live and to be the greatest we can be in any given moment. We have the potential. Friends, let me clap Reverend John again. <laughs> yes, justice right now. And we savor the beauty that we have within us and to share the love that we are. Thank you, Reverend John.